Disclaimer. The views expressed in this video, as well as the content and images, are for review purposes only. If you are interested in what we are reviewing, please pick up a book and form your own opinions. What I like and dislike, others may not like or dislike. Reading is a very individual thing. If you do pick up the book, please leave a review, as this not only helps out authors financially, but is essential to helping us improve our skills. Furthermore, if you'd like to support me and my channel, you can follow the links down in the descriptions to my own works and my own books, and you can also help out by liking or commenting below and subscribing to the channel. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to have you all with me today, because we have a trial of sorts. First, this is the first review I'm doing of the second book in a major series with my new format. Second, this review will be more scripted than those previous, partly to better cover my thoughts and feelings, partly to practice my writing. This also feels like a good series to test this on, as I'm currently working my way through the second Malazan book, and I don't want that one to be the first I try scripting on. This week we're reviewing The Light Fantastic by Sir Terry Pratchett the second book in the Discworld saga. I do intend to finish many of the larger series I've started because, one, they're popular and get a lot of views, two, it helps the indie books I review get more attention, and three, these major series are popular for a reason, and they're worth looking into. So without further ado, let's get into the recap, and a warning if you haven't read the first book, there are major spoilers ahead. This book is 36 years old, and I don't feel bad for spoiling it. We start where the last book ended. Rincewind and Two Flower have stolen a spacefaring vessel from a bunch of cultists who tried to sacrifice them, and have escaped in the only direction possible, which is to say, off the edge of the world. Things are going poorly for Rincewind, as he has a wardrobe malfunction, i.e. lost his helmet. Since this is a story that follows a man who is running from the literal embodiment of death, his plot armor is activated. Quite literally. And reality itself is shifted in order to save him. It is later revealed that this is because he holds one of the eight spells of creation in his mind. The spells themselves decided losing one of their own was too much and teleported Rincewind and Two Flower to the Forest of Skund. Meanwhile, it is revealed to the wizards of the Unseen University by death, with the big D, that Calamity is about to befall the Discworld. Mainly, that it is about to be consumed by a proper-sized star, not the mile-wide one which orbits their world on the back of a giant space turtle. The only way to save the world is to read all eight spells of creation at the proper time. The wizards agree that they need to get the eighth spell, which has taken up residence in Rincewald's mind. So, instead of finding him and escorting him back to get rid of the spell that has been stuck in his brain for most of his adult life, they decide to track him down and murder him. This is partly for greed, and partly because of the nature of the spell. Back at the forest, Rincewind is thoroughly confused. He was dying, and now he's in a forest where the trees keep trying to talk to him and where there's a giant mushroom with windows and a door. Convincing himself that he's not mad as long as he doesn't answer the tree's questions, he asks a local gnome for help. He and Two Flower are escorted by the gnome to a dead witch's gingerbread house where the two rest and commit vandalism by eating it. Eventually, the wizards hunting Rincewald show up, being dramatically unstealthy because wizards, their prey quickly is alerted to their presence. Rincewind and Two Flower steal the dead witch's broom and fly away, scaring the crap out of a local shaman as they take a shortcut right through his bonfire. After pulling high into the sky, they finally get a good look at the massive red star that is heading for the disc world. This freaks Rincewind out, who does the only sensible thing, which is forcing the broom into a nosedive. Rincewind and Two Flower wake up on a large, floating rock. After a quickly resolved standoff, they convince the druid who is flying the stone that they are not a threat. Then, after Rincewall convinces Two Flower to stop questioning the druid about how rocks flying is impossible, in case it suddenly decides to stop, the two settle in and fly with the druid to his people's great computer. This computer, it turns out, is a massive pile of stones that has been organized and programmed from what I can only guess are ruins and blood sacrifices. By this point, Rincewind is finally homesick for his hometown, which he left while it was burning to the ground in the midway point of the last book. This is where we are informed that this is a normal occurrence since the town is basically made out of kindling wood and tar, so it should be rebuilt by now. 
In fact, numerous sections of this book are dedicated to Rincewind's homesickness of a city which is described as having a smell on par with a garbage barge full of used adult diapers on a sunny July Monday. Rincewind will have to put aside his visions of home as Two Flower wants to stick around for the ethnic religious ceremony to honor the moon. He is promptly horrified, as many soft tourists are, that this quaint ceremony involves human sacrifice. Something Rincewind believes is par for the course because priests. Two Flower decides to give the head priest a lesson in humanity that can only come from someone completely unaware of their very obvious frailty and possible usage as a bonus sacrifice. Rincewind is not sure how to progress when he's met with an old man holding a knife to his throat. The old man tells him that he knows how to save Two Flower as long as he does exactly what he says. And that is where I will leave off the recap. This will bring you to the 25-30% to 30% mark, and is a nice bit of tension to leave off on. So let's get into my likes, dislikes, and my thoughts. First, my likes. The humor in this series is definitely going to make it one of my new favorites. It's plain-spoken, sarcastic, and in places absolutely absurd. There is also a lot of humor in Rincewald's plot armor, which becomes a plot in itself. It turns out the reason Rincewald cheats death so often is a combination of the eight spells of creation's influence and his own cowardice. Basically, the spells chose him because he would rather run than fight. Another thing I liked is there are a number of Easter eggs scattered throughout the book. I normally don't like this kind of thing because of recent media. It could be because this book is meant to be ridiculous that they work. It could also be because of the age and I didn't quite catch all the Easter eggs. I think it's more that the references are minor. They don't stop you and go, hey, remember me from that popular thing? Or it could be that I've become much easier to please when being spoon-fed when they use a smaller spoon. I was a little worried at first when it seemed the book was going in the same direction as the first, being little more than a comedic series of disasters that the protagonists just walk through. In a lot of ways, it still is but it's helped by the fact that Rincewind is just trying to get the spell that's been stuck in his head for most of his adult life out and go home. This book also has a satisfying ending, with Rincewald finally catching a break and having a little optimism for the future, which is incredibly rare for him. My dislikes. In the first book, I mentioned some of the weird reality and believability bending things that would happen to the two protagonists, i.e. see the talk about the airplane. Most of that is gone but in its place are parts of the story that just kind of drag. It wasn't to the point of making me bored, but I did have to go back over the last third of the book because a lot of it just wasn't impacting me like the first book did. There also wasn't much of the chaotic silliness that the first book was saturated with. This was one of the things that really made me want to continue the series. There is still a lot of absurdity, but it feels like the whole thing has drifted to a greater internal consistency. While great for story, it's not so great for weirdness, and I love proper weirdness. My thoughts. I do still like the series and will continue reading and reviewing it. I get the feeling the stories will become less ridiculous as time goes on and the author has more of his own material to pull from. I was a bit put off by the setup of this world at first, thinking that by its nature it would be very limited. I think I may have been wrong. And much of the absurdity comes from the near-constant world-building, learning about trolls, going to weird new locations, how the characters respond to the outright weird. These things are expanding what I at first believed would be a very limited setting. And now for my final thoughts, and this is going to cover a spoiler, so if you don't want to hear it, you can end the video here, and I'd like to thank you for getting this far. 3, 2, 1. In the end, Rincewald and Two Flower go their separate ways. Two Flower decides he's done being a tourist, and Rincewind is finally free of the spell that filled his mind and decides to return to the university to learn new spells. I know there's a lot more books in the series, and I wasn't expecting to say goodbye to these two so soon. Rincewind does appear in later books, but the next doesn't appear to have anything to do with him. In fact, the next book appears to be about a female wizard and the contempt the other wizards have for her. I'm worried it may feel a bit too contemporary, but we'll see. And with all that said, I wish you all good luck. Thank you for listening to my review. 
If you have any books that you would like to hear my take on, please leave them in the description. I do tend to favor indie authors over conventionally published, but I will read whatever I find interesting or whatever captures my fancy. If you would like to read, review, or criticize my own works, I will include a link in the description. Also, please keep the comments civil in the comments section. Also, if you enjoy what I do, please consider giving this video a like, sharing my work, or subscribing to my channel. Thank you.